Hello and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We've seen so many good things so far. We saw how we as believers in Christ Jesus, we are called to do the same works that Jesus did and greater works. Then we saw that we're called to heal any disease, any sickness for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Then we saw that the disciples did the same things uh, after Jesus uh, ascended to heaven. And then finally, we've seen that further on in the New Testament, we've seen that God has given us, the believers in Christ, everything pertaining to life and godliness here on earth. And that includes physical healing. And today we're continuing with the eighth subchapter from the big chapter about God's will on healing. And this sub subsection is entitled Every Spiritual Blessing. And if you have your Bibles ready, let's begin by reading a first passage from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you're welcome to use any English version that you have available. And let's read it together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let's read it one more time uh, slower. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the past tense with every, every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly places in Christ. In the heavenly places in Christ. Where are you as a believer? You are in Christ. We'll see what, what, what are the heavenly places. You know, many Christians today and Bible commentators, when they read this passage, they advocate that in the New Testament, the blessings of Christians are only spiritual in nature and not physical and material or tangible. And what they mean by spiritual is actually what they imply by that word is actually something symbolic, metaphorical, unknown, mysterious, not tangible. That's kind of what they most Christian, many Christians mean by spiritual, you know, devotion, that this idea of spiritual, what is a spiritual person, a spiritual, a devotional person, a godly person, a moral person. And all that are good, but spiritual means more than that, the term spiritual. And they say that only in the, the Old Testament, the blessings of the people of Israel were physical in nature. In other words, the, the physical blessings are only for the Old Testament. Have you heard this? What, are, what were those physical blessings? Were abundant crops in agri agriculture, herds of sheep and camels, servants, fertility in giving birth to children, and health, physical health. However, the blessings of the church are only spiritual and they are no longer physical, only spiritual. Have you heard this idea before? I heard it many times, but we will see today that the spiritual includes the physical and it's actually uh, more than the physical blessing. The spiritual blessings are more than the physical blessings. And people in general have this idea, as I said in the beginning, that spiritual, this term spiritual means moral, devotional, unreal, mystical, unseen, intangible, invisible, unreachable, or without sound. Something ambiguous, something vague that you cannot measure, you cannot touch, you cannot see. But we will see that spiritual means so much more than this. And it's actually something very real. And let's begin by studying the Greek word used for spiritual in this passage in Ephesians 1.3. It is the word, uh, is the Greek word pneumatikos, where, which is formed from two, two, two other words. Uh, the Greek pneuma means spirit, as many of you might know. And the Greek tikos means belonging to, or from, or pertaining to. So in other words, when we put these two words together, together, pneuma and tikos, pneumatikos, it means this, in this, in this verse, the phrase spiritual blessing means that the blessing 
comes from the Holy Spirit, pertains of the Holy Spirit, belongs from the Holy Spirit. It has the origin in the spiritual realm and is created by the spiritual realm. And I will say it one more time. Spiritual blessing in this passage, a spiritual blessing, pneumaticos, means that uh, that blessing is a real blessing, it's a physical blessing, but it comes from the realm of the spirit. It is created by the spirit, spirit realm or by spiritual means. It's not created by physical, through physical means. And that changes completely the connotation of spiritual blessing, isn't that right? The spiritual blessings are blessings with properties and char uh, characteristics, attributes pertaining to the spiritual world. When you have a spiritual blessing of health, a pneumaticos of health, it means that that blessing does not depend on the treadmill, on how healthy you eat or how less you eat, but it depends only on the Spirit of God. It depends only on the power of God. That's a pneumaticos of health, a spiritual blessing of health or divine healing. It is realized through the Spirit of God. And that kind of blessing is not subject to the natural earthly law, earthly laws. It's not submitted to the natural earthly laws. It's a spiritual blessing that holds, that lasts. And uh, furthermore, moreover, when you have a spiritual blessing, let's see now, not in health, but in finances. When you have a spiritual blessing of pneumaticos in finances or money, that does not depend on how much you've studied or what job you have or how intelligent you are. The, all those things are good. We need to study. We need to go to school. We need to be smart. But beyond that, the power of God supersedes all that. If you lack in any of these things, a pneumatic or a spiritual blessing of finances does not depend on, on those physical material things. Amen? When your welfare comes from the spiritual world, and the welfare of the new creation comes from the spiritual world, it's in the heavenly places, it is not affected by the natural laws. That's so exciting. It's not affected by natural laws. Nobody can compete with you. Nobody can take it from you. It is spiritual. It lasts. doesn't come with any trouble or problem or trial afterwards. The Psalms say that the blessing of God is not followed by any unfort uh, unfortunate event or uh, any trial. The blessing of God brings joy. It's not like enjoy it now that uh, something worse will come later. That's a world, worldly mentality. That's not our God. Our God is a good God, is a merciful God, is a God who wants to bless us. And everything that comes from God is eternal in nature. So your health and welfare are eternal in nature. They are spiritual, eternal. They last. In the invisible realm of heavenly places that is all around us, and I'll explain here what are these heavenly places, you'll notice in Ephesians 6 that the heavenly places include the earthly realm. We are located in the earth, in the heavenly places, but we are still on earth, right? So the, the whole earth is in the heavenly places because it's a present reality. Then we see that in the heavenly places, we have also the spiritual forces of darkness, those spiritual forces of darkness from Ephesians, the wicked spirits, the devil, darkness, they cannot be in the third heaven with God, right? But they are in the heavenly places. So the heavenly places is not just the, uh, the third heaven where the throne of God is, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The heavenly places includes the earthly realm where we are, the second heaven, the universe, and the, where the spiritual forces of darkness are, and also the second and third heaven, where God is, because the Bible says that Christ is also seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. So the heavenly places is the whole spiritual realm of the third heaven, the second heaven, the earth, where we are seated with Christ, Christ is seated with God, and we're, where also the spiritual forces of darkness are, where the fight is going on. So the heavenly places is all the spiritual realm around us, the invisible spiritual realm. That's exciting. In that realm, we have the authority and the position, the rank of the right hand of the Father. We have the authority of the Father, of the right hand of the Father. Can you imagine that? 
That's such an honor, such a privilege. The sitting at the right hand of the Father is not for the future life uh, only, for the new heaven and the new earth. We are right now positioned. We are not right now given the authority of that position to function here on earth. Amen? So I wanted to explain what the heavenly places are. So in that realm, in the invisible realm, God has given us every spiritual blessing, every possible physical blessing that is created in the spiritual realm and needs to be manifested in the physical realm, in Christ, in the heavenly places in Christ. We are in Christ. We are in the heavenly places already. The heavenly places in Christ is in our hearts. Our recreated spirit functions in that spiritual realm. So we are kind of with one foot in the physical world with our physical bodies and conscious mind and with another foot in the spiritual world because our spirit and the unconscious mind, they function, they function 24-7 and they function at a quantum level. They function in the spiritual realm. So we, we are called to bring those blessings that God has already given us in the spiritual realm to manifest them in the physical realm in the physical realm, through faith in the word, in what he has spoken in this world. This is so exciting. This, is cha this changes completely what spiritual means. The spiritual, the spiritual word is real. And our spiritual fight of faith is real. Amen. And when, the, uh, uh, when it comes to the spiritual blessing, God gives them freely. He has given us every spiritual blessing, but he also maintains them. We don't need to sweat for them and to maintain them. The world can hope for the best, only for the best. And people from the world that are not yet in the family of God, they need to work hard, to sweat, to get anything, and even when they, to get anything by hard work. And even when they get it and they manage to have it, like a promotion, an increase in salary, a certain position, a car, a house, they have to continue to work as hard in the same in the same way to maintain those to keep them to maintain and sometimes through ungodly means they are always stressed they are always worried to maintain them to to keep them to safeguard them but when god blesses you he maintains them for you the power of god maintains those blessings you don't have to yes you you work hard you have to get educated but you know when you are when your blessing is created by the spiritual realm, you're working hard. It's not so much working hard. And any challenge is actually not a challenge because you work with passion. We work, you work uh, fully assured. You have faith in your heart that well, you're doing your part, but God, the spiritual blessing of God, the favor of God is much more than what you can do. It's beyond what you can achieve by spiritual means. For instance, in my job, my promotion doesn't depend. Yes, I do my best. I, I even this month, I have received a, a, a review with that I'm a high performer, that I do beyond expectation. I do a good job and I do that. And God uh, supports me. God gives me wisdom, insight. But this, this review and this um, uh, opinion that people formed about me and the work that I do is... Uh, I know for sure that is the favor of God. So many times I have insights that other colleagues of mine, they don't have it. And those insights, that wisdom comes from the spiritual realm. realm. Those are signals from the invisible spiritual realm that my mind and my spirit is able to, to catch, it is able to receive and to manifest them in the, in the physical world. And all people around, they are amazed. How, how did I know that? How can I know that? There are things that you can only know by the Spirit of God. And that's such an exciting life. And God, the Father, our good Father has given us all these blessings. We only need to take them and to enjoy them. Let's move on and I want to take a few more passages to explain the physical uh, nature of these spiritual blessings, that they are physical blessings uh, that are, mani are, are manifested in the physical world, but they are created by the spiritual realm and they are real. Let's read on Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. It says this, Speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. See what this passage is. It talks about spiritual songs. What are these spiritual songs? 
Are they unseen? Are they unreal? Are they without sound or intangible? No. What are spiritual songs? They are songs that come out of our mouth from the Holy Spirit. And most of the times they are songs in tongues. You sing in tongues where the Holy Spirit is free to speak through your mouth in, a, in the spiritual realm and create these beautiful spiritual songs as worship to Father, to the Father God. So spiritual songs are songs, they are physical songs, but they are created from the spiritual realm. They are not natural. Amen? And the same Greek word pneumaticos is used in this passage, in this context as well. Pneumaticos, a spiritual song, a, a pneumaticos song. Amen? Another supporting argument is that everything we see in this world, this world, how, were, how was this world created in the beginning, in, in Genesis? It was created from nothing, from the spiritual realm. God is a spirit. And he created this physical material world by speaking and bringing into, into being. So the physical world was created by the spiritual realm. The spiritual world is more real, if you want, than the physical world. It's just that we don't see it with our physical eyes. But the spiritual world is very real. And it's more powerful than the physical one. It governs the spiritual, the, the physical one. The spiritual realm governs the material world, controls the material world. And we are recreated in that realm that has the authority, that has the power to change things in the physical world, in the material world. Amen? That's so exciting. I don't know about you, but I am excited because the Christian life has become more real to me. It's not just something moral, something nice. We're Christians. We go to church. We go through the motions. No. The Christian life is a powerful life. It's a real life of blessing and of victory. Let's read one more passage from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. In this context, uh, context the Bible talks about the body of Jesus when he was raised from the dead. If you read the whole context, it was sown a natural earthly physical body. Jesus came with a physical body and it was raised from the dead, a spiritual body, a glorified body. Amen. And here it also talks about our spiritual glorified bodies. If you read further on that we will have at the second coming of Jesus, we will also have glorified spiritual bodies as Jesus had after resurrection at the end of times. And we will all receive a spiritual body. And here in this context for a spiritual body, the word spiritual there is also the Greek word pneumaticos. And that means that the spiritual body of Jesus was a physical body, but it was created from the spiritual realm. Let's analyze more further on Jesus' spiritual body after resurrection. Okay, He had a spiritual body. And if we take the same connotation for, uh, that people assign to spiritual blessing, that means the spiritual body of Jesus was intangible, was symbolic, was metaphorical, we could not be seen. It was spiritual. It was not physical. It was not material. Let's see if that's true. In 1 Corinthians 15.45, a verse next after this one, 44, the Bible says that Jesus, the last Adam, became a life-giving spirit, became a spirit, a life-giving spirit. Now, I have a question for you. Did he walk as a ghost after resurrection and nobody could see him? Does the Bible say that he was a ghost? No. People saw him. The disciples saw him. Thomas was able to, to touch his wounds, his hands. His body was completely physical. And he was able, Thomas was able to see that he was not just a spirit without flesh and bones. However, his body was, the Bible says that it was a spiritual body. Then later on, we see that he ate together with the disciples, stayed with them 40 more days. And he told them a lot of things about the kingdom of God, taught them about the kingdom of God. 
and he spoke to them. So he was a physical body, although it was a spiritual body. And all these examples, what do they do? What, what I, am I trying to do? Is to debunk the idea that a spiritual blessing is not, a tangible, is not tangible or real. The body of Jesus after resurrection was as real as my body and your body. Amen? But it wasn't subject to the natural laws of the earth. He could disappear. He could walk through walls as we read in the gospel. He just appeared in one room with that spiritual body, which he didn't do before that, before the resurrection with his physical earthly body. So the spiritual body was not subject to the natural laws, but it was still physical. We, all, we will all have this kind of spiritual body that will never die. Amen? They will last forever. They are not subject to sickness and corruption at all. And even our current mortal bodies, the Bible says that because of the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit quickens our body. And even on this earth, even though we will die one day and uh, change our bodies into a spiritual body, right now we can live a, a sickness-free life. Our mortal bodies, is not, they, can, they can live without sickness because they are subject to the Spirit of God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, even our mortal bodies can disappear, be teleported, go through walls, go through fire. And I have a few examples. We have the Philip who went to Gaza and he was teleported with a mortal earthly body because of the spirit that he was in him, the Holy Spirit. It, it just took him. And then we have in the Old Testament, the free young, the free young uh, man in the Old Testament in, in, the, in the furnace, in the fiery furnace, they walked unharmed. They were not even a new creation. But when the Spirit of God came in that furnace, they were able to overcome all the natural laws and walk through fire un unharmed. So even that's hope. That's, that's so exciting that even with our mortal bodies, the Holy Spirit can supersede the natural laws. The recreated Spirit that is in us can supersede the material physical world that uh, try to affect us in a negative way. Amen? So, where are these spiritual blessings that God has given us? Every spiritual blessing, everything that could have be done or given to us, God has given us. Amen? And all these spiritual blessings, where are they? They are included in the eternal life we already received in our spirits. Eternal life, the life of God that he has given through the recreated spirit, include, has a right, uh, uh, owns all those spiritual blessings that God has given together with the recreated spirit. And all the facets of the eternal life are actually the descriptions of all the spiritual blessings that God has given us, which only need to be worked out and manifested by us from the spiritual realm into the natural world. How? By faith in what God has said about the new creation. By faith in the word of grace, in the word of Christ. Amen. So in the heavenly places where we as Christians have the same authority and power as Christ. You notice the first passage said that all these blessings are in the heavenly places in Christ. We are in Christ. We are in the heavenly places already. And we also have at our disposal already granted by God every possible spiritual blessing which includes all physical blessings actually a blessing is a physical blessing it's just created with different means this is way much better than what the people of israel all the old testament had why because their blessings were based and dependent on their obedience to the law they were blessed only when they obeyed the law or when they brought the animal sacrifices if they didn't obey the law, they were cursed. They didn't have access to health and to blessings. But in the New Testament, our blessings are dependent on Jesus' obedience and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. They are not dependent on our works, on how much we obey God, on how good we are, on how much we pray or fast. Our spiritual blessings are secure. They depend on Jesus' obedience, which was perfect, on Jesus' sacrifice. And that's so much better than the Old Testament. Our spiritual blessings are more, more firm and more secure. And they are eternal. And they are without conditions. 
God has blessed us unconditionally. There's no condition except faith to believe that you have those blessings and you have access to them now. Amen. You know, when I, when I bought my first car in Romania many years ago, it was a brand new Dacia Logan. And I, I so much wanted a board computer to show me how much kilometers I can drive with the current uh, gas that I have in my tank. I wanted to know a little uh, more information about the car. But I didn't know from the beginning that I, I had a computer. It didn't show up on my board. And I drove for one year one year or maybe more without knowing that my car had a computer, a board computer. Until one day I stumbled by mistake and I pressed some button or two buttons at once and voila, the computer was there, was showing me all this stuff that I wanted so much to have. I thought I didn't have them, but I had them, but I couldn't benefit them. I couldn't take advantage of those for a whole year. Why? because I didn't know that I had it in my car, that it was included in my car. I didn't know how to access it and that I had it already. But after I found out, I began to enjoy those benefits. Amen. This is a very, it's an example from my life. I was so amazed and so surprised when I found out that. Another example, imagine that Bill Gates, who is the father of Microsoft, who has a lot of money now, is He's superseded by the Amazon CEO, Bezos. But imagine that Bill Gates would move into your house. And when he moves into your house, he brings all his gadgets, all his stuff, electronic stuff. He renovates completely your house. He does it like state-of-the-art house. And he moves there. And then you begin to enjoy all the benefits just because he moved in, in your house. That's how Jesus with us here is with us now. Jesus moved in our house by the Holy Spirit. And now he, we enjoy all the blessings, all the benefits. He brought all the blessings for you in you, uh, in your body, including health. Amen. When Jesus moved in, he brought all the blessings, all his nature, all his life, everything that he is so that you just enjoy them by faith. You, you just need to believe. Now you find out that you have access to those, that they are yours. You have a right to them. You have a responsibility to manifest them. And now you, you, you need to learn how to believe and how to be firm in faith, how to manifest those things on the outside. Amen. Isn't God's word good? It brings faith. It brings joy. It brings peace. It builds you up. The word of God always brings hope, always brings strength and power. This was about spiritual blessing. And we found out today that health, prosperity in finances, um, victory, all these are included in every spiritual blessing that God has already given us in the heavenly places, in Christ, in the past tense. He has already given us all those. It's not just a promise that will be manifested at the end, but it's real right now. Let's move on to the last subsection of this big chapter, the ninth one, which is entitled, Why does God want you healed? So God's will, God's heart is for you to be healed and to heal others. But why does he want you to be healed? First, God wants to heal you because that's his nature. That's his character. That's who he is. He's a God. He's a healer. He's the God that heals. And his will, as we have seen so far, is to heal because he's a good God. Second, God wants to heal you because he loves you very much. He loves people very much. God is a God of love and he has compassion on you. He has compassion on us. He loved us more than his own son, as we've seen previously in the, the previous sessions. He has compassion on us. And Romans 8, 8.32, we read it before, says this, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, with him also freely give us all things? He has given us all things. And we've seen that they are in the spiritual realm. Third, why does God want you healed? It, because it brings honor, glory, and praises to God from you and from other people when they see the power of God manifested. 2 Corinthians 4.15 says this, 
for all the things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. When grace comes, what is grace? Grace is the power of God. Is everything I've been talking to, that we are under grace. It's not just mercy. It's not just unmerited favor. Grace is power. And when that power is spread and manifested through the many, may, uh, it causes thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. It brings glory to God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 says this, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the revelation of Jesus Christ? It's when Jesus Christ is revealed through you. Yes, it can be the second coming of Jesus, but Christ wants to be revealed through you now on the earth. How is he revealed? When his glory, his power is manifested. So our faith, how it is tested? When we are attacked by sickness, by trials, we are tested. Our conviction is tested. It's put to the fire. But our faith brings glory to God, brings glory to God and has an effect when we overcome those tests of fire. We don't endure them, but we overcome them. We trample upon them. We remove them out of our, out of our bodies. If we talk about sickness, we many times we are tested by sickness. And when sickness comes, you are tested in your faith about healing. Does God want to heal me? Can he heal me? Does he want to heal me? If yes, then sickness, you have to flee. And then when sickness flees, God gets the glory. Amen? Fourth, why does God want you healed? Because you advance the kingdom of God and bring damage to the kingdom of darkness. When you are walking in health, you are able to do more for the kingdom. Moreover, when you heal others, you advance the kingdom's values and power and bring damage to darkness. That's powerful. That's what Jesus did. That's what disciples did. And that's what we are supposed and called to do in Christ Jesus. To damage the kingdom of darkness and to bring the goodness of God, the message of reconciliation to people. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 25 to 26 says this. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So he reigns now through us and he expects us to put all his enemies under his feet. Because Jesus Christ gave the final blow to the devil. He defeated, completely, defeated him completely and permanently at the cross. But now he expects us to enforce that victory over the devil, over the works of darkness, to put all the enemies, sickness, poverty, lack, to put it under his feet and to bring blessing to people. And the last enemy that will be destroyed when he comes is death. He will completely annihilate death. But until then, we destroy death wherever we see it, wherever we see the effects of sin, the effects of darkness. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 19 says this, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall, be, shall by any means hurt you. So what happens when healings and uh, when people are healed and demons are cast out from people? The kingdom of darkness falls. The devil goes down. The kingdom goes down. The influence of the kingdom of darkness is diminished, is limited. A man decreases. And then another thing. Why would Jesus give us authority over, the, over all the power of the enemy and to not do anything with it? He has given this authority, this power over all the power of the enemy to the disciples and implicitly to us. And he cannot hurt us by any means. If you're strong in faith in what Jesus has given you, what God has given you, the devil has no power over you or over me. He only has the power of deceit. He can only distract you, deceive you, take you from the word, 
and put you in the flesh. And uh, that's his only weapon. That's how he gets to you. He doesn't have real spiritual power or authority over you. Colossians 1.13 says that we were transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. When you are born again, you are no longer under the dominion of darkness. Amen. Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 says this. But if I cast out demons, says Jesus, by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So when does the kingdom of God come on the earth or upon you or in a place? When? When demons are cast out by the Spirit of God. The kingdom has come. The kingdom is real. That's the kingdom of God. Deliverance, freedom, health. That's when the kingdom of God is manifested. And Jesus manifested the kingdom of God. So when we are healed, when we heal, we advance the kingdom of God and um, bring damage to the kingdom of darkness. A fifth reason, why does God want us healed and wants, and wants us to heal? Because when we do that, we prove his acceptable, good and perfect will. And we confirm and establish his covenant with us, with you and me. Amen. Let's see a few passages about that. Romans 12, 2 says this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are called to prove that God's willing, God's heart, is his perfect will is to heal, is to deliver, is to bring blessing to people. Deuteronomy 8 verse 18. This is in the Old Testament where the Old Covenant was established. But the principle is the same. See what, he's, what he says. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. See, God gave them power to get wealth. And this is uh, striking for so many people with the mentality, uh, to, uh, the Christian mentality today. God has given them power to get wealth, to be rich. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Why? So that he could brag, he could show this covenant, this relationship with his people to the world. So that he will, so that the whole world will know what what a powerful covenant the people of God have with God. That's the way an, a covenant is established. When the covenant is proved, when you need the power of a covenant, you need the benefits of a relationship of a covenant. That's when the covenant is established. If I make a blood covenant with you, a, a, a contract with you or a covenant, and I, there's a moment when I need the benefits of that covenant. I need you to fulfill your part. That's when the covenant is more strengthened, is more established because you see that the covenant is actually real. It functions. What God has promised to you and what you have promised to God, they work, they function. When you need God to fulfill his promise, his part of the covenant, then he comes and he fulfills it and the covenant is established, is confirmed, is proved. And I'll have a whole series about the blood covenant in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and we'll see so much in so much more detail how powerful is the blood covenant that God has made with his people and he has made with us the new creation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the sixth reason why God wants us healed and wants us to heal is that we make the gospel attractive to people. When it actually works in your life, in my life, the gospel becomes attractive and you become a living testimony and you proclaim God's excellences, God's goodness to people. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are a chosen race. The Christian, the new, the born again believer is a chosen race right now in present, a royal priest. You are a royal priest or a royal priestess. Right now on the earth, you are a priest. You are a holy nation. You are a people possessed by God. Why? So that we may proclaim, we may show to the world what the excellencies of him who has called us 
out of darkness into his marvelous light, into his marvelous life. Amen. We are called to proclaim those excellencies, the attributes of God, the character of God. I have two more reasons and we will close this subsection. Seventh, the seventh reason why God wants you healed and he wants you to heal. You grow in faith for other areas of your life. How? So when you are healed, you experience healing, you heal others, you grow in faith. And it's actually not a growth in faith, but you release more faith. Because we will see that we already have all the faith in our spirit. But our minds block that faith with doubt, with unbelief. But when you experience healing, you see healing manifested in your life and in the life of other people's. Your, you re begin to release more faith from your spirit in the outside world. When you see it working in one of the most difficult areas, sickness and healing is a difficult area because you need to see something tangible and real happening when you pray for the sick. So if you overcome there and you see, you start seeing healing manifesting consistently uh, and perseverantly, you see it consistently happening, that's when you begin believing for more, for other things, not just for healing. Isn't that right? So your, your faith is released more. Your mind opens more for more things of God. And I'll give an example here. Remember King David? When he had to fight the giant, Goliath, what did he say? What did he say to the king? God helped me with the bear. God helped me overcome the lion. This giant will be nothing. So he started small. We started with the lion. He started with uh, them continuing with the bear and then continued to Goliath. So when he had to fight Goliath, he used, he, he strengthened himself thinking, oh, I, I thought and I overcame a lion. I overcame a bear. What is this giant? He's a man. Yeah, he may be a little bit bigger than the bear and the lion. He has some, some uh, fighting tools. He has a sword. He has a big shield. But nevertheless, I can beat him. And our minds actually function that way. When you have a victory in one area where you experience you had an experience good or bad in the past in one area then when you face a similar experience a similar event you catapult you transport the effects the the effects that that past experience had on you and you manifest it in the new experience so that's how also you you re, begin release more faith you grow in faith because if you had the victory in one area, now you can use that victory to have another bigger victory in another area or in the same area. Amen. So another reason why God wants you to see miracles, see healing is because your faith is strengthened. Your faith is become stronger and more faith is released to do other things of God, to do more things for God. And the eighth reason, and the last one that I found, there may be more, but this is what I found so far. The eighth reason is that you become a, blessings to, a blessing to others as well. It's not that you are blessed, but you become a blessing to others. And God's heart has always been to serve and not to be served. I mean, that's what Jesus came on earth for. He, when he came on earth, he came to serve the people, not to be served. And Matthew 20 verse 28 says exactly that. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Whenever you are sick and disabled, what happens? Your ability to serve others is diminished, is limited. You cannot serve others if you are in a wheelchair or if you're sick, if you are in a bed, if you're stuck in a bed with fever or other sickness. I don't know. But you cannot serve others. Your serving capacity, ability is diminished, is limited. And if not all the times, altogether forfeited. You cannot do anything. Depends on the sickness, depends on the disease. And you, in that moment, you will need to be served Instead of being out there and doing the things of God and serving others, you will need to be served. Do you realize that? So when you are healthy, you are well, 
that you are able to serve others. If you are in a bed, if you are sick, that cannot be the will of God because he wants you to serve others, not to stay in a bed or in a wheelchair and endure sickness or endure a handicap and waste so much time when you could do so many things for the kingdom of God and bring the goodness of God and the grace of God to other people. Amen. So God wants you to be a reflection be, even before you speak anything about the gospel, he wants you to leave the gospel, to show the gospel. You go to people and say, look what the, my God did, does for me. He did for me. He's a good God. It's not something I'm trying to put on your throat and try to manipulate you, try to uh, deceive you, try to some, ki some kind of selling you something. So many times we degrade the gospel of God because we try to employ people. We try to, to attract them with different purposes, different agendas. So maybe, maybe, maybe they will accept the gospel like uh, as if, if they accept the gospel, they do us a favor. No, where we have better words, where we have a better reward. The gospel is so valuable. I don't have to implore people to accept Jesus Christ. I don't have to beg or come with all hidden agendas. Oh, I'll become friends with you. I'll invite you for a meal and do this. These, these things are good. They are wise. But we shouldn't degrade ourselves and devalue the gospel of God in that way. The gospel of God, the gospel of Christ is something to be proud of. You don't have to apologize for the gospel or be ashamed of the gospel. Actually, Apostle Paul says this, and I think he said it in a, same, in a similar context. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for anyone who believes. It is the power of salvation. Salvation here on earth from things of this earth, from the negative and things of the darkness, and also salvation in the new heaven and the new earth from hell. But the gospel is the power of God. And if you want to enjoy God, if you want the goodness of God, you should be interested to accept the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. Because you are, you are in a place where the devil and darkness takes advantage of you. And God is a good God. So when you leave health, you show health, you proclaim health, you are healthy, then the gospel has more power, even before you say any words. Because the gospel, the kingdom, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 4.20, the, the kingdom is not in words, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in words, but in power. The kingdom is powerful. Amen? And I hope this session here, we close the second big chapter about God's will and God's heart on healing. And I hope you are convinced by now and persuaded by now that God will, He can and He wants to heal you of anything, anytime, anywhere. Amen. And if you're not, you can go back. If you're not convinced, then you can go back and review. Go again through the verses. And in our next sessions, we will begin a, a new chapter, a big chapter, where we will talk about all the objections to healing. Finally, we get to that place where we'll discuss about the objection of God's sovereignty, the already but not yet theology, the jobs, uh, boils and suffering, uh, Paul's thorn, Trophimus, Epaphroditus. There are so many objections that Christians find and we'll answer them one by one and we'll show, we will, we will see together that those object, objections don't hold any water, don't have any power because, because they were probably interpreted uh, wrong in a wrong way. They were not understood in the right context and they tried to bring and to stop healing from, the, from being manifested in the, in the people of God. And that's the work of the devil. That's the strategy of the devil to keep us away, to, to rob us from the benefits of the gospel. But we will kill all those sacred cows, all those uh, wrong opinions, wrong interpretations, so that you will be free to believe, to be confident that God's will for you is to be healed and to heal others. Anyone, of anything, anytime, anywhere. Amen. May God bless you until we see each other again. Amen.